You will know from the card which I hope you have, the white card with our preaching arrangements on it, which is available in the vestibule, that we are studying First Thessalonians on Sunday evenings, and this is the second evening that we have turned together to this part of Scripture, probably the first letter that Paul wrote, quite possibly the earliest writing in the whole of the New Testament. I was introducing last Sunday evening the message of this epistle to you and its general background, calling attention particularly to the unusual circumstances in which Paul came to Thessalonica. He came, you will remember, after he heard the voice of a man from Macedonia, as he describes him, which he heard in Troas when God had closed many doors of opportunity for them to preach the gospel. And then the voice of the man from Macedonia summoned him to come to that area of northern Greece to help them. Paul sailed to that part of Greece and began his ministry in the town of Philippi, where you will remember the record tells us in Acts 16 that he was imprisoned eventually and certainly suffered a great deal of physical and other abuse. He came south from Philippi and went to Thessalonica, one of the chief cities of northern Greece, and there, as he began to preach, he was again accosted and assaulted by the opposition from Jews who were incensed by his presence and his message. Paul fled from Thessalonica to the town of Berea, which is further south in the same area of Macedonia. And it is apparent that the enemies of the gospel had not wasted their time. They pursued Paul to Berea. And from there he had to make his escape and came down eventually to Athens. But afterwards, when they had been unable to oppose the gospel... And when Paul and his companions had eluded them physically, those who were the enemies of the gospel had begun to slander the apostle and his companions. And the old trick of those who were unable to discredit the message that they then turned to try to discredit the messenger was the main ploy that they took up in order to destroy the apostles' ministry. Now, the form of slander they used, you can easily deduce from Paul's defense in this passage that we read in 1 Thessalonians 2 this evening. They were basically casting doubt upon his sincerity and his integrity. They were saying to the Thessalonian Christians, these young believers who were still at the deeply impressionable and unstable stage, they were saying to them, people like this man Paul and Silas and Timothy, they are not to be trusted. They are only in this job for what they can get out of it. Their interest is in self-preservation, hence their fleeing. Their real concern is for financial gain. And this is what is displayed in their saving their own skins. They are making a pretense of caring for you, but really the only thing that matters is themselves. They are on a kind of ego trip. 
Now, Paul finds it necessary to respond to this. You might think you would have been as well to have ignored it. But he responds to it for this very important reason. That in the service of God, a man's character matters every bit as much as his service and activity. What he is before God and before men matters just as much as what he does. And indeed the one conditions the other. Now that's not true in many other spheres of life. In many other spheres of life it is possible to divide between someone's character and their effectiveness. We see that most of us every day. It is entirely possible to shut out all consideration of a man's moral integrity and to concentrate on how effective he is. But you cannot make that division in the service of God. Wherever, however, and in whatever capacity you are serving Him, it is true and will always be true until the end of time that the person I am in the secret of my own heart before God, conditions the work that I do. That, of course, is why it is so absolutely vital for those who serve God to be concerned about the cultivation of their own soul before ever they begin to deal with the souls of others. Lest that tragedy that is described in the Song of Solomon becomes theirs. I have tended other men's vineyards, but my own vineyard I have neglected. And you can see the dramatic picture of someone who is supposed to be an advisor in viticulture. And when you go and inspect their own vineyard, it is a jungle. This is the principle behind Paul's defense. He is not really greatly concerned about defending his name for the sake of his name. But he is jealously concerned about the prosperity of the gospel and the honor of the name of his Savior and the glory of the God whom he serves and the integrity of the message he preaches. And he knows that all of these things are linked into his own personal character. And so Paul begins this defense, which really is the largest part of what we have read this evening. But in the process of defending himself against these charges of insincerity and a lack of integrity, the Apostle gives to us several permanently valid principles for Christian service, Christian evangelism, Christian ministry, and I want us to look at these in a moment. There are three of them in all, but I want us first to get the general flavor or atmosphere of this passage. For it is the 
flavor of the whole of Paul's life and ministry. And what lies behind and permeates through the whole of these twelve verses we read is an atmosphere of openness and absolute integrity. Do you notice the number of times, if you have your Bible before you, where we get the phrase, you know. He is coming to them, those who are making charges against his integrity and sincerity, for example, and he keeps coming back to this phrase, you know, brothers, look at verse 1, you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. Verse 2, as you know, we had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi. Verse 5, you know we never used flattery. Verse 9, surely you remember our toil and hardship. Verse 10, you are witnesses as well as God. Verse 11, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his children. You see the whole emphasis. It is that the apostle is able to stand there before his accusers and he, as it were, points round and says to them, you know that this is true. I can look you straight in the eye and say to you, you know that the contrary is a lie, and it is true, every word that I am speaking to you. God is my witness, but you also are witnesses. And he confronts them with an openness and integrity which is really very remarkable when you think of the things that he was accused of. And so with that general background atmosphere, where the apostle apparently has nothing to hide, has nothing about which he needs to dissemble, nothing about which he needs to lie, And knows that there is no man or woman who can point an accusing finger at him. He begins to set before us these three particular ways in which Paul and Silas and Timothy may point to the way their lives and their labor were an authentication of the work of the gospel. Let me say to you, first of all, that it's very evident that they avoided deviousness in their motives. They avoided deviousness in their motives. Let me just point this out to you in verse 3 where it's summarized, and this is the key verse of this particular little passage. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick or deceive you. On the contrary, now, what Paul is telling us clearly in this first principle that has to do with motives, they avoided deviousness in their motives. What he is telling us is that motives matter in the service of God. And they matter in the sense that if my motives in serving God are largely self-display and self-advancement and self-interest, then I shall most certainly blight the work of God rather than advance it. And you will notice that the important thing about motives 
is that they are hidden. We cannot inspect one another's motives just by a brief shaking of the hand. Motives are hidden. But Paul says, the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to deceive you or trick you. On the contrary, our motives before God are pure. This, of course, is why the ordination service in so many churches and denominations, and certainly in the Church of Scotland, has a question that the ordinand is asked, which goes like this. Are not zeal for the glory of God and a desire for the salvation of men, so far as you know your own heart, your great motives and chief inducements in entering this ministry. And the ordinand has to ponder that and say, they are. And that secret motivation is something that every single one of us serving God in whatever capacity, and there is not one of us who is not called to serve God in some capacity. We need to examine our own hearts before God because motives matter in the service of God. And the ultimate reason they matter is that God has said, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. My glory I will not give to another. So in whatever sense I am seeking glory for myself, and robbing God of it. And I want to tell you that it is possible to use the service of God for the glory of the servant rather than the glory of the master. In whatever measure that is my motive, God will withdraw from me because He will not give His glory to another. He will certainly allow you to get whatever glory you are angling after. But so far as a true work of God is concerned, God will withdraw His blessing. I find that a very solemn thing, and I hope you find it so too in whatever sense. We are called, you and I, to serve God. I remember reading of Dr. Campbell Morgan, who was Martin Lloyd-Jones' predecessor in Westminster Chapel, who came to a particular moment in his ministry when people were idolizing and lionizing him as the greatest preacher that London had ever known, and all sorts of extravagant things like that. Most of them, as Campbell Morgan said afterwards, such nonsense that he was astonished he was ever tempted to believe it. But one night he found himself bowed before God and pleading and crying to God that he would purge and purify his motives. And he, as it were, saw all the reputation of Campbell Morgan being placarded before him, and the glory and honor of the name of God set on the other side. And it was as though God were presenting him with great alternatives. And at four o'clock in the morning, he wrote in his journal, Thy glory, Lord, and Thine alone. 
That may be more of the secret of Campbell Morgan's fruitfulness and usefulness to God than we will ever know. But although motives are secret, there are evidences of these motives that Paul presents in several ways to the Thessalonians. Do you notice that there are three of them here? First, there are the things they willingly faced. Verse 2, We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. Now, we know from Acts 16 what that opposition was. That opposition was that they were flogged until the skin broke, and when they were in the prison, they had to be washed because the blood had congealed a flogging was no idle kind of tickling with a whip in these days. It cut right deeply into the flesh, and they were flogged and put in stocks in the inner prison, and they were left there. They had faced such pain and suffering and humiliation and opposition from this company of people. But when they were released and they came from Philippi, they went straight down to Thessalonica and began again to proclaim the gospel. Now what Paul is telling them is this, you see. We had suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. They went, then went on to Berea. He left Berea in the midst of a riot and went down to Athens and then on to Corinth. And the apostle poured out his life in the face of that kind of opposition. One of these men from Czechoslovakia that I met this summer said to me, you know, one of the things that strikes those of us who come from the East is that those of you who come from the West have never really tested your seriousness in your consecration to God. I said to him, in what way would you have wanted us to test our seriousness? No, he said, let me take that back. I don't want to see people like yourselves testing your seriousness the way we have had to test it, but we have had to stand up and on the line place our very lives for the sake of the gospel. We have faced the kind of humiliation in our families, in our homes, in our place of work where we have seen our children deprived of university places because of our faithfulness to Christ. And he went through a catalog of these things. And I tell you, my dear friends, I do wonder whether my motivation has ever really been tested that way at that level. He talked, as many of them do, about the day the knock came on the door. Now, I sometimes wonder what would happen if the knock came to our door. And the alternatives were faithfulness to Christ. Or the many things that these people are having or have had to give up gladly the things they willingly faced and went on proclaiming the gospel and living for Christ and being true to Scripture, and so on. Notice, secondly, the things they studiously avoided. These are the things they willingly faced. In verse 5, you have a list of the things that they studiously avoided, and this is another test of their motivation. You know, they said, we never used the following things. Flattery. 
in sincerity, nor did we put on a mask. Self-interest to cover up greed, a hankering after praise from men. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you, not from anyone else. The things they studiously avoided. Flattery, insincerity, wearing a mask. Probably he means a mask of convenience. You know the kind of thing, the mask that fits a particular circumstance or place. We take it off when it's unsuitable. And we have another mask that we put on for that occasion. It's a very vivid metaphor. But it's the essence of insincerity, the mask wearing. Self interest or greed. And praise from men. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you, not from anyone else. Why was that? I'll tell you why that was because the only praise he was really interested in was the praise of God. That's a place that we really need to covet to get to, beloved. We really do. In the service of God, we really need to get to the place where the only praise that really matters to us is the praise of God. And the only approval that really counts with us is the approval of God. Now, that doesn't for a moment mean that there are not multitudes of our brothers and sisters who need encouragement. They do. But there is a hankering after the praise of men which is an alternative to the praise of God. And Paul says, we were not looking for praise from men, not from you or from anyone else. Now, the reason for this takes us to the third of these evidences for their motivation. The things they willingly faced, the things they studiously avoided, and notice the things they consistently sought in verse 4. And in each of these three paragraphs that we look at this evening, you will notice there is a metaphor. In this case, it is the metaphor of stewardship. On the contrary, verse 4, when he denies impurity of motive, on the contrary, he says, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men. We are trying to please God who tests our hearts. So what are they consistently seeking? They are consistently seeking divine approval. They are consistently seeking a life that pleases God and makes them fit to be entrusted with the gospel. That's the stewardship metaphor. And this is the consistent concern of their lives as God's servants. They want to please not men, but God. Now again, that doesn't mean that they're going to be the kind of obtuse and angular and awkward fellows who go out of their way to displease people. There are some who imagine that faithfulness to Christ means that you get everybody's back up. It is not just true. It is absolutely false. It is a concern that every true servant of God will have that he may win people rather than alienate them. But ultimately his concern will be not to please men, but to please God. The concern to please men creates instability in life. You can see how easily that happens, can't you? It turns in every direction from whatever source.
people are calling upon him to do what they want, he finds himself unstable. And when he pleases God, there is an integration about his life and a stability about his character, which is the fruit of living for that rather than for the other. So the evidence of purity of motive is seen in the things they willingly faced, in the things they studiously avoided, and in the things they consistently sought. So they avoided deviousness in their motives. You notice the second thing in verses 7 to 9 is that they exhibited self-sacrifice in their service. In verse 7, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. There is the metaphor in this passage. He moves from the steward who has custody of the gospel and has to be approved by God for that to the metaphor of the mother who cares for her children. And the apostle says, We could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers. Now this whole relationship that existed, do you notice, between the servant of God and the people of God was a relationship that Paul is not ashamed to say was like the relationship of a mother with her children. And as many people have commented who write on First Thessalonians, isn't it an extraordinary thing that a man with this tough masculinity that marks out the apostle's character should gladly embrace the whole idea of being a mother towards her children with the gentleness and love and care that is there. But the thing he is chiefly pointing them to is that they not only came to share the gospel, they came to share their very lives. Now, it is a characteristic of a mother in relation to a child, and the metaphor is perfectly chosen, more probably than a father in relation to his child, I guess. Although I probably have the fathers out to assault me at the end of the service, but I think it's true that a mother will gladly sacrifice everything for that child. the child she has born. Now, Paul sees himself in this picture, you see. I have travailed again until Christ is formed in you, he says. Now, his way of speaking of how they came to the birth in Christ is not theological. It's obstetrical. I went through travail, he says, until Christ was formed in you. And I have this relationship to you of a mother with her children. Now, my dear friends, this is absolutely authentic, biblical, New Testament Christian service. This is what it means to serve the Lord. Not to be busily engaged in labor and work all the time, hectic, hectically active, and always in the public eye. What it means is that you've got the kind of character and relationship to those whom God has given to you as your particular concern. That just as the chief shepherd laid down his life for the sheep, you would gladly lay down your life for them. That's what it means. I went with a young man years ago to a new parish in Glasgow which he was to be serving. It was a most unattractive place. We looked around it. It was not the kind of place anybody would have said, I hope God sends me there. 
we went into the manse. It had everything from leaky roofs to dry rot and everything in between. Two years later, I remember as he said to me before I left him the first time, I don't think God would call me here. Two years later, we walked along some of the main roads. And he said to me, you know, I never thought I would be saying this to you. But I say it with absolute seriousness and without an ounce of melodrama. I would gladly lay down my life for these people. Now, that's how Paul felt about the people God had sent him to. I remember my dear friend Douglas Macmillan saying to some of us at a conference that he and I were sharing and speaking at. He was speaking to ministers, and he said to them, you don't have a real relationship as a pastor to your people unless you're ready to die for them. If God should so call you, And you must never stop short of that. We gave our own selves to you. That's so different, isn't it, from saying, well now, it's really rather inconvenient for me to be involved in this at this time. I wanted to watch this program on the television. I wanted to be there or here or wherever. that we didn't just share the gospel with you. We gave ourselves. So they exhibited self-sacrifice in their service. And that self-sacrifice gets down to the business of money in verse 9, do you notice? Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Now, in verse 7, he has said, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. And that probably does mean financially, because it was a principle the apostle had that the servant of God, as Jesus himself said, is worthy, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And Paul subscribed to that principle. But he says here, I worked as a tent maker in his spare time, if he had any. He worked in order not to be receiving a penny from them. As I say, the principle is that he might have done. But he was ready to live sacrificially so that he might never be thought as they were charging him to be in this for the money. I know a man who works in the Amazon in Brazil and who serves God there in great privation and discomfort. And I suppose he has been there for 30 years. And during that time, he has never accepted one penny from any church or any body or any company of God's people that he has not earned 
himself one way or another. I met him some years ago, and he said to me, the reason I do this is I want to take away every shadow of possibility that people could misunderstand why I'm here. And I'm bound to tell you, I I think I found in my own heart something rising up and saying, I'd love to live like that. They exhibited self-sacrifice in their service. Here's the last thing, and just in a few words. They displayed consistency in their behavior. Verses 10 to 12, you are our witnesses. Now, that's one thing, but here's a different thing. And so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless We were among you who believed. You know that we dealt with each of you. And here's the third metaphor. As a father deals with his children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. They displayed consistency in their behavior. And, of course, the reason that that is so important is the reason I was suggesting to you last Sunday evening, which is that these people were not going to read of Jesus in their Bible. Now, that doesn't make them odd, because our contemporaries in our generation, they don't read of Jesus in their Bible either. They could, but they don't open their Bible. Many of them don't have a Bible. Where will they read of Jesus, therefore? And the answer clearly is, in your life and in my life. And the question is, what do they see? Well, Paul says, you know, you are witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you. We were like fathers. There are many ways in which he has some purpose in using this figure of speech of fatherhood. But you know, I guess part at least of it is that a father has a responsibility to set an example. And what he was saying is, please God, there will never be a day when they say there was such a gulf between the things you preached and spoke of and the way you lived. And the world is waiting to see the beauty of Jesus in us, it is the most powerful evangelistic medium in all the world, my friends. And when we sing it, we really need to mean it. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen. In me all his wondrous compassion. That's what the world is waiting for. God knows how much we need to avoid deviousness in our motives, to display self-sacrifice in our service, and to show consistency in our behavior. Only God knows what would happen in the church and in the world if we even had the beginnings of that in our time. And may God begin it in me and then in you. Let's pray together.